think it's always a, a beautiful teaching, just the teaching of kindness. Because when we get too caught up into the world, we just lose track of the context. And one thing that helped me along my journey was when Jesus told me, never forget how frightened your brothers are. It helped to be reminded of that from Jesus over and over. Because if we forget that, then it's like we run off and we get involved in much ado about nothing, is what Shakespeare called the world. And then the kindness is, becomes farther away from our awareness. But when we remember the fear level, that everyone who seems to come to this place has a lot of fear underneath, then I think we just have to keep that context in mind as we go through this awakening. And um, you might say that when the separation seemed to occur, that the escape hatch was given the instant that the door closed. So, actually, honestly, we've had this escape hatch available for millennia. You know, it's, it's always been there. We can't say that we were closed off from heaven in any real sense, but it must mean that there must have been a huge amount of fear to flee into form, to flee into time and space had to be an enormous amount of fear of the light to come up with such an intricate, complex, mesmerizing, clever disguise for ourselves. There must have been a lot of energy that went into that, to try to hide in time and space. And so, even though the escape hatch has been there all along, and we could say there's nothing really wrong with the escape hatch, it's active. It's very active. It's not defective or faulty. The spirit doesn't come up with a faulty escape hatch. It again must mean that there's, there's quite a fear of waking. A terror of waking that, to make such an elaborate defense against awakening. And one time I was in Michigan, and somebody came up to me and they go, Oh my gosh, we found the perfect Star Trek episode for you, Dave. We thought we watched one the other day, but this one was very, very strong. And it was about uh, Captain Janeway and her crew visiting a planet that had undergone a planetary disaster. And in order to protect themselves, they buried themselves underground to wait out the planetary disaster because the atmosphere of the planet was uninhabitable. So to survive the planetary disaster, they, they buried themselves. And so when the ship arrives, it comes close to the planet, all they can see is a, a desolate planet and they think, well, it's not inhabited anymore, but when they go under the surface, they have faint signs of life. And so then they do a little bit of a computer analysis to see uh, what has happened, and they, they surmise that this society has put themselves to sleep. And then they check out the escape hatch, and the escape hatch is functioning. So, I'm like, hmm, I can see there's some parallels here. Planetary disaster, escape hatch is functioning, and yet those that have put themselves into stasis, those that have put themselves to sleep, are not using the escape hatch. So maybe we need to take a little look at this metaphor from Star Trek, because if it's there and it's functioning and we're not using it, we maybe need to take note of something. 
in this particular Star Trek, there's so much fear that that the inhabitants that have put themselves to sleep, they, the fear in their mind generates a character in their dream world, a fear character, that is constantly threatening them with death. That's what keeps them so preoccupied. They're so afraid of death in this dream world, that they don't even bother to look for the escape hatch. And Another thing that's interesting is that um, everyone in this dream world is wearing a mask. And another thing that's interesting about this dream world is that um, it's all one thing. It's, you know, everyone's dressed colorfully and they're wearing a mask. And they're even dancing, almost like to try to distract themselves from the escape hatch. And if anyone tries to escape, they go to the guillotine and they have their head chopped off. <laughs> but I thought, in terms of Earth, my, there's such a preoccupation with survival. It's almost like we try to weave in some other things, but in mean, all the countries I've gone to, there's, it's, the survival is so, such a heavy, heavy thing. It's like that's the, the gravity of this world. It's not just the gravity that, that seems to hold all the bodies on the planet, but the gravity of the planet, but it's the gravity of the state of mind that's so preoccupied with survival. It's, it's part of our conditioning, it's part of our family systems, you know, even when you become an adult and and you date, you know, it's like, it's not too far into the first date. What do you do for a living? What do you do for a living? It's so programmed and it's so heavy. And therefore, it's almost like you just squeeze in a little time to ponder some of these deeper philosophical questions or ponder this uh, waking up thing. So I think for me, when I came across the Course, it took quite a lot of willingness to give myself over to the direction that this was going, because the, the ego voice in my mind was like, don't waste too much stuff on, don't waste too much time on this, we have other important things to do. And I think all of us have dealt with that, whether it's doing music, or doing art, or all the different things we do, even our spiritual practice, it's like there seems to be this concept of balance. And we do have to maintain some kind of equilibrium or we could seem to, seem to flip out. <laughs> but, but there's this sense of the gravity of, of survival. So, that's why the Spirit is really calling us and saying, well, if you go for awakening, that is actually the most important thing you could go for that the promise is, that the Spirit says, I will provide for you, if you go for it. That the means will be provided, that the means are, are in the end, and that the means are given along with the end. So you get the whole package. You don't have to like figure out the means to reach this end, which is what we have to do in this world. Any task we have, if you want to build a house, you've got to come up with the means. The means come before the end. But not with awakening, the means are included in. So, we have this strength within us, that if we begin to move in that direction and trust in it, then things will start to shift in the dream world, just in terms of symbols, as messages from the Spirit, as the light, using the dream symbols to say, this is going to work out. You're going to actually go deeper and deeper into this experience, and it's all going to be handled. So I think that's, that's very important in this journey. That whoever is sent to you, and whoever you are sent to, there's a huge blessing there. And the blessing is a, is a state of gratitude, and that state of mind, and that everything else shall be added unto you that helps you serve 
that purpose of awakening. It's really important that we trust that. We have to really trust that because otherwise it's just going to be difficult. It's going to be, if, if you don't really trust that, there's going to be this nagging voice in your consciousness that's always going to be nagging you about anything you do in terms of the spiritual practice. It's just going to keep nagging and nagging away. It's going to tell you it's not practical. And at some point, with my prayers and meditations and readings and everything I was doing, it just got to the point where I felt like I crossed a threshold and I thought, no, it's actually getting easier. It's easier for me to devote my life to this than it is for me to resist it. Even though this nagging voice was trying to tell me it was the opposite. You know, make a little time out here and there. Okay, make a little time out. It's like, no, I don't want to make a little time out. <laughs> I want to make a lot of time out. <laughs> and then the more I did that, the more it screeched. Like, oh, you're going to pay for that. You know, you're falling behind. No. All the other people are putting, putting their time in. It's like even cultures, I think sometimes in certain cultures like Asian cultures where there's so much emphasis on, on, on achievement and being productive and this and that, and even starting to educate children, younger and younger and younger, trying to teach them the, the ways, the technologies and everything, with the intent of making them productive citizens to contribute to the gross national product of the country faster and faster. And it, it just, that strikes me as so different from my childhood, where I, yeah. I would go out, I would be in the creek bed playing with clay and crawdads, and just, I think, I had a lot of playtime, mm -hmm. a lot of time just to, just to be, without any kind of demands seemingly placed on me. And I think that, that is important. We can, we can learn that from children. When I went down to South America too, I was down in South American cultures in Argentina and Colombia and Venezuela, but I, I just was like, oh you guys, I love your siestas. And they, they were almost apologizing for the siestas, in the cities at least, not in the rural areas. We all took siestas together, no doubt about it. But in the, in the cities I noticed that, that they were starting to lose the tradition of the siesta, and I would go to these meetings like this, and I would say, oh no, please, don't lose the siesta. You know, it's like, I think that's your, one of your greatest gifts to yes. the whole world. Yeah. Yes. Take those afternoon naps, close the business down, pull down the shutters. You know, I said, this is important. This is very important. Because there's a sense of ease with that. There's this, this a loosening from time of the, whatever, the eight hour work, workday and the, the, the rigidity and the structure around that. Work to live, work to live, work to live. You know, it's deeply ingrained programming. So, to me it has been a journey of trust, of thinking, if I really go for this, if I really surrender here, then I really trust that everything will work out. And that's something that came through early on for me, was how Doors would just open, things would be show up, things would be provided. And I thought, this, maybe it seems extreme to the world, or radical to the world, but it actually feels natural to me. And that's what Kay was talking about when she ran out of those spaces and she's off to answer the call, off to answer invitations. I felt, that that's what I was told too, that I would be invited. It wasn't like I had to go personally try to make my way, or carve out a niche, or find a way to do it. That life takes care, there's a rhythm, there's a purity with that. And, and I needed to build my confidence and trust that that's just the way it would go. And then, as I really relaxed into it, it was like, just like being carried down a river. It was, it was so gentle. And most of the places I went was like, here we are in a living room. And, mm -hmm. and it's been about 25 years of living rooms, <laughs> and basements, and backyards, and barbecues, and beautiful 
places everywhere, just so many invitations. And that was not again part of my conditioning growing up. You know, that was, nobody said you live that way. That was like an unknown realm. And so it hasn't been like, you know, briefcases and board meetings and conferences and hotels and so forth. Uh, it's been a very different kind of travel. It's been going like from hearth to hearth and home to home mm -hmm. and heart to heart mm -hmm. meetings, holy encounters, connections. And, and through enough of it, when you give yourself over to it, you start to really feel it in your heart. You start to say, oh yeah, this is natural. This feels more natural than the other way, which is work, work, work. Save, save, save. Spend, spend, spend. You know, it just, I don't know, it just didn't seem very natural. And then in these last maybe 15 or 20 years, when I've worked so closely with people, it's almost like I was a an unwinding counselor, like I would join with people and they would say, yeah, my world's falling apart. I'd say, good. <laughs> good. And I'd say, oh yeah, you're, you're unwinding, you're dismantling, you are, are, are cracking apart so that you can come whole again. Uh, and I had a lot of training in psychology and studied a lot of different spiritual pathways, but it was like, it was more just relaxing, let the spirit do it, of unwinding from these concepts and roles and taking on a function that was using the skills and abilities that had been developed previously, but in a whole different direction. So that was interesting, because I, I think I think actually the seemingly the hardest nuts to crack were corporate. Uh, when you go into corporate, you know, you wear a pretty hard mask. You've got to really take on a lot of unnatural things to go corporate. So I think that the toughest nuts that I've watched the Holy Spirit crack, you know, he's got to peel and peel and crack and crack and peel and peel. There's a lot of crack and peel with that because it, it's, like the ego has said that corporate gives you everything, gives you all the perks. The perks of this world, not really the perks of the spirit. And it's, so it's like, it's convincing. And the other thing about it, that as I really discovered, was that this world was backwards and upside down. So it was, everything was inverse. So the more you believed you were successful in succeeding in this world, the more you wound yourself into darkness and farther away from the light. There's actually success was a completely inverse equation in terms of awakening. So, I had learned a lot of things in 10 years of university, both in undergrad and grad, but it's like now I had all the tools and the instruments that the ego says to, you know, play on earth and succeed. And the spirit was like, Yep, now give them all to me, because I've got to use them to heal and bless everyone. We're going to have to wake up every single one, which is really just reflections of one mind is asleep. It's not like there are multiple minds asleep or multiple souls, it's really just one. Mm -hmm. but, it's, but it seems that way when you're in the quicksand, when you're in the mesmerism of the world. It seems like a daunting task. And, then, and, and you're in that darkness, and then you look around at all the others, and they're all marching. It looks like Hitler's armies. March, 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 march. Corporate is its own version of march, march, march. You know, to the beat of money. Instead of the, the beat of taking over countries and, and power, it's the same thing. It's marching to money. So, it's been quite fascinating, because then I, when I traveled the world, and I lived out in the woods, in a trailer, and I would go around and meet people and everything. I found the ones that were most ready to be unwound, and most ready to crack open, were a lot of people who had gone through severe addictions. Actually, people had come through like 12-step programs <laughs> that had, had been knocked down to their knees, and their knees were on the ground, and they 
could look me in the eye and they could go, it's not to be found here, but they had gone through extreme pain and torture, really torturing themselves with whatever their chosen addiction was, just trying to distract away from the emptiness. And so, in the world's eyes, they were like the forgotten ones. They were the ones that fell through the cracks. They were the ones that uh, didn't make it in the, the ladder. And so, they were, sometimes they were still pretty sad and they had a lot of despair and I would sit down with them and I would say, no, 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 you don't understand. This is actually wonderful. And they say, wonderful? How is this wonderful? And I said, uh, instead of being twice removed from reality, you're only once removed <laughs> from reality. You're closer than you think. You're cracked open, you're down, and you're coming closer and closer to a point of total disillusionment with the world. Because no one goes into reality without first going through a disillusionment with the substitute world, with the fake world that was projected by the ego. So, it was like we had some kind of a, a connection, a bond, because they were knocked down to their knees, and I had been knocked down to my knees, and somehow we were all on the floor, and going, okay, it just goes up from here. <laughs> you know. Like the Eagle song. And I know that you can't, won't let me down, cause I'm already standing on the ground. <laughs> you know, it's like we're in that place, we're on the ground, and that's good. So, I think that's important, that's why even a lot of, uh, of things like, like A Course in Miracles, um, where has the Course been most impactful? The Course was translated, was scribed and translated into different languages, but there was a professor down in Mexico named Guzman, and he got a hold of the Course, and he decided he would just translate it on his own to Mexico, and somehow it got into the Mexican prison system. Yes. The Mexican prison system, of course in miracles. And oh, did that take off. Imagine yourself in prison for whatever earthly reasons, but you're there, and you're a captive audience, and you're in a cell, and suddenly somebody brings you a course in miracles. <laughs> where you've got a lot of time on your hands, so to speak, and not a lot of distractions. <laughs> They've taken away your tequila, they've, <laughs> they've taken away your family, they've taken away your television sets, your musical instruments, you're in a prison. And so, I first heard wind of like all these miraculous experiences happening down in the Mexico prison system, and people that were getting early parole, they were actually getting out of prison through spiritual transformation. <laughs> I don't think so. I think he, he avoided prisons. I don't think he actually spent much time in prison in his life. He was out running the drug rooms and so forth. But, but I thought, hmm, you know there's something to the conditions. The conditions of the mind have to be ripe to go for this. And then when I went to South America, I first went to Argentina in 2003 and the economy had just collapsed. The value of the peso was very, very low. I ended up getting a hotel room on the ocean with breakfast for like seven or eight dollars wow. a night. Um, that's a collapsing uh, currency. <laughs> and, and children were starving, babies were dying, um, there was corruption sweeping through the, the system, and I noticed that when I first went to Buenos Aires, they had so many course groups that they had stopped counting. They had stopped counting. In a city of maybe 15 million people. And I'd gone to 
to different places, but that was around the United States and Canada, but that was my first trip overseas, and I thought, hmm. And I would say that's gone on now for some time. In Mexico City and in Buenos Aires, long ago they stopped counting how many groups, because it was catching on like wildfire. The Course in Miracles came, we know, I told you, Shakespearean blank verse, and it came in English. Do you think that English is the original language? Do you think that most books in the world are English because it's, it came in English? No. There was more Spanish Course in Miracles books on the planet than there are English books. You can start to see, that we know that in the Spanish culture, Jesus is very big. Uh, in Catholicism, there's a great adoration, and Guadalupe, and, and all the saints. Um, if you've been to Mexico, you notice there's a lot of parties. Yeah. There's a lot of <laughs> celebrating the saints. It's very devotional. I think that devotion is very important. I think that even though all those centuries they would have been devoted to worshiping and and practicing the teachings of Jesus as best they could, I think most people started to realize that, that Christianity had kind of been hijacked. Um, especially if you're listening to the promises that come through the Bible, and you're not experiencing the promises in your life, and you're following the theology, and you're doing all the rituals, and you're trying to be the best Christian you can be, and something's not working, then you start to get to a point in your mind where you see something's fishy here. <coughs> the way shower, I have a great love for the way shower, but something about the practice is not working. And then especially when your babies are dying, when your economy start crashing, and you start to lose the comforts and conveniences of the world, when corruption r races through your uh, government, when there's drug lords, and tra drug trafficking, and sex trafficking, and all these things, and you've got a, a devotion and a practice, and it's not working, there's something in your mind that goes, hmm, we've been hoodwinked here, there's something not right. Well, that's what happened with the Course, is the Course came along, and, and the, the minds were ready, saying, oh, we want the real Jesus. We don't want a paternal system, a patriarchal system. We don't want a system of hierarchies of bishops and cardinals and popes and ministers. We don't want to be told that, that we can do these certain sacrificial practices or rituals over and over and over and over, and they don't have an impact in our state of mind. So, in one sense, and that was very important when Jesus sent me around the world to all these cultures, because I could see that, just like the parable from the Bible, if you throw the seeds out, it's important that there be fertile soil for the seeds. The seeds will not germinate, the seeds will not sprout if you have too many thistles. And thistles, thorns and thistles are distractions. I also noticed that there was, the Course was taking hold and seemingly much more impactful, more in third world countries and in places where materialism had not run rampant. Mm -hmm. The materialism is the thorns and the thistles. That's why in the parable from the Bible, that the seeds just could not spring up. Because there was too much else there. And we talked this morning about the heart, and we talked also about the altar within. If you have too much on the altar, that even if you have good seeds to sprout, they don't have the nourishment. They don't have the stillness required. In some of the places I went, um, they had, like in Argentina when I went there, I went out to the rural areas and they could not afford to buy the course. It was like bootleg course. They would have like one chapter out of 31 chapters that they had translated into 
Spanish. And I would find a group of women, sometimes mothers, who were around, all over around, passing around this paper, which was one chapter that they had. And I could see it in their eyes. When they first met me, they, I was just a strange man from a strange land, so they had a lot of doubt and suspicion on their faces. Who is this man? What is he doing out here? He's out of place. He doesn't look. But then, as I joined with them, and I would start speaking through them, and the smiles and the laughters came, it would usually only take maybe 15 or 20 minutes when we would start to feel that spirit connection, that heart connection, laughter, lightness, and lots of curiosity, because again, they felt like they were dealing with something profound, but they had a lot of questions, very, very curious. So, these kind of travels were the symbols to my mind about how it, we really have to make a, a space, we have to we have to make a nurturing space in our life for the spiritual journey. And even people that I've worked with for years, it started off usually going into their homes, and it was like a lot of homes. There was a lot of busyness. There was a lot of people pleasing going on. There was a lot of protectionism going on. There was a lot of hiding going on. There was, in some cases, chaos. <laughs> I could come into what seemed to be a chaotic family, but just with the presence to say, no, you're worth it. This devotion to spirit, you, you need to put that as your top priority. It can seem crazy to put it above finance in a world where everything's based on survival, but, but actually we need to invert the priorities in order to find the escape hatch. Because the escape hatch is functioning. There's nothing wrong. There is not a faulty escape hatch. But it takes a devotion to that escape hatch. It takes a prioritizing. Now, I've been doing this for 25 years, and I have a number of people that have left their jobs, have left their families, have left their countries, and the only way you do this is you have to do it in your mind. You can't just change the form. You can't do the, the little switcheroo thing where you are the geographical cure. I'll just move to another place. Or the, the relationship switch cure. I'll just swap. I'm going to swap a, an angry spouse for a new model. And then he read it. Oops, I ended up with the same person. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the hand goes up. Right. You try to swap. The form is a little different. The form is a little different. The form is a little different, but the content. It, we have to do this from the inside out. That was a movie that came out recently, Inside Out, Pixar. So, so good. So good. Get in there to those emotions. Wow. <laughs> that was fantastic. That's the kind of movies we had coming out. Pixar came back, they were kind of a dying community, but, the, but Inside Out really lifted them up. We have to live from the inside out. We have to live intuitively. We have to tell ourselves, we can live intuitively. We're not going to do it anymore, relying on people's opinions and external <coughs> advice. External advice, all this external advice. We're not going to live that way anymore. Because why? Because it's a delay. It's delaying our experience of joy and happiness. So, the, and I have to say the way that the life of David played out was nothing, nothing that I ever imagined. I've worked with a lot of people, a lot of one-on-one -on -one working with people over the years, all for dismantling. That was, that's why we met for lunch, we met for dinner. That's why we took those long walks. That's why we watched those movies. That's why we came together. It was all for healing, for dismantling, for letting go of this faulty thought system. And then communities. I think Paramahansa Yogananda said before he laid aside his body, he said there will be groups, study groups, 
support groups, communities that will spring up. He could, he was just foretelling the way that the Spirit uses this. This is not a solitary journey. The lowly journey fails. We need to join, we need to collaborate. This ego is so clever that it's really quick to say, out of my mouth, my life, I'm going to do this all by myself. I'm going to do it all on my own. And as Jesus says in the Chorus, if you look for truth only in yourself, you will not find it. He's not talking about the kingdom of heaven is within, within your mind, but he's saying if you look for truth only in yourself, you will not find it. It's the old me, myself, and I. If you think that personally you're going to find the way to truth, it isn't going to happen. And therefore, it's like, okay, then show me the way. Well, these different configurations will come into your life. The configurations that you had not planned, that you did not foresee, they are coming. Because these configurations are necessary for support. You will be vibrationally drawn to your tribe. And you have to let go of the past, whatever that was. Whatever configuration you found when you came to this world, it was the ego that picked that configuration. I had a point in my life where I started to say, Jesus, what is going on and what's gonna, what will become of me, what will become of my life? And uh, I said, can you give me, I just need some symbols here, if you can give me some really clear direct symbols that would really be helpful. Especially around relationships, like, where is this heading? I, I don't know what's happening. Certain people are disappearing from my life and sometimes the friends that I've known for years and what is going on here? Can you give me an analogy, a metaphor? And he said, yeah. He said, uh, I'll, I'll use a card game. I said, a card game? 52 card, 52 card pickup. <laughs> What's 52 card pickup have to do with my relationships? He said, yeah, put all those cards on the floor. Okay, you see them down there? The ego dealt the deck. The ego deals the deck. And so I said, so where is this going? And he said, I want you to pick up every card off the floor. Those are your relationships. Pick them all up and get them back in the deck. They've been dealt by the ego. The spirit didn't deal that deck. The ego dealt the deck. I want you to pick all those cards up and get them back into the deck. And I want you, Jesus said, to hand me the deck. And let me deal the cards now. Well, I tried to stash my grandmother in my <laughs> front pocket. Because, really, I thought, She's really, she was like a symbol of unconditional love. Mm. She never had a harsh word for me to say. So I just tried to, I, I was going to play 51 card pickup. <laughs> and then Jesus said, no, that's not the way this works. You have to give me every card. And so I hesitated again, because I didn't want to give grandmother Lillian over to him. But he said, no, give it over, cough it up. Uh, and basically, he said, now, and then I will do the dealing. And I said, well, what will it be like? Will I get to see those cards again? Will some of the, the will I get to see my 52 cards or not? He said, some of the cards may come back, but remember, I will deal them. Yeah. Wow. I will deal them to you. And you must let go of all expectations with that day. And that was like a very, very important part of my life, because I was having a lot of guilt and a lot of heaviness over trying to maintain relationships. 
And there's so much energy that goes into it. We saw our movie clip today, how the brother and the father, they had good intentions, but just didn't see how misguided it was, inverting an entire system to try to play out what they believed the, the daughter and the sister needed. And, and none of us know what's in our own best interest. So this 52 car pickup analogy was very important for me. And some of them did come back, but there's more than 52 cars. As I started traveling around the world and even meeting all of you, you're part of a giant deck, for my mind, of those that the Spirit has dealt back to me with the purpose of awakening. That's why, in a quantum sense, that's why we seem to perceive a room full of people that are very interested in spiritual awakening and love and light and happiness and joy is because the Spirit has brought us together. It was our guidance that brought us to share these words, to seemingly share this space, to allow this space to be used for such a sacred purpose. You can feel the depth and you can feel the reverence and how important this is. This is not a casual encounter. This is a configuration that was coming about because of our desire. And really, that's why I like quantum physics, because everything we perceive in this world is just a reflection of our consciousness. Newtonian physics told us that there was a real world out there, and that you could measure it, and experiment with it, and learn from it. But that's just not the case. Quantum is showing us that, that consciousness is the, the root of what we call the world. And the quantum physicists are sounding a lot like Jesus. Uh, there was a quantum physicist that said, there is no world. Paul Davies said that many years ago. And then I got to Jesus, uh, Lesson 132, and he said, there he's saying too, there is no world. Quantum physicists, Jesus, science, religion, it's, there's no world outside of what you think. The thoughts that you think you think and the world you see are identical. There's really not an inner and an outer, that's just another illusion of, of dichotomy. And so, as you open up and you allow your mind to accept the way things are in a quantum way, you see absolutely that everything is connected. Everything is completely connected. There's nothing that's disunited. There's nothing that's not connected. And as you give yourself over to that, and you appreciate the feelings that start to come, the joy, the love, and the happiness, love naturally radiates and extends itself. You're not even going to have to figure out what you're going to do with your life. It's just given. It's just given to you one moment, and then the next moment, and the next moment. All that anxiety of what do I do, what do I do, that finally just gives way to, you're like a leaf in the river. And the river is a big river, and it's got you, and you can just float down it. And life can be as easy as floating. Yeah. yeah. That, that's like a prophecy, that, that nursery rhyme then turns into a giant prophecy yeah. of our entire life. That we are deserving of just being carried. And that feeling of that life is involuntary. If you, if you use the analogy of breathing, it's not like you go through the day. Who goes through the day counting all their in-breaths and all their out-breaths? We would think that's ridiculous at the end of the day. Okay, how many thousand in and how many thousand out? What's the statistics? What's the data? It's ridiculous. And yet, we do take things in this world to be serious. Jobs and savings and possessions and, and abilities and skills. Things are given a lot of weight. Money, for example, is just because it's a symbol of exchange that seems to work forth, but needs, which are all still beliefs, then money takes on elevated status and 
Jesus put out a couple pamphlets along with his Course in Miracles, and he did have one sentence in there about money. It, it was only three words. Money is nothing. <laughs> nothing, no thing. Money is nothing. How different that is from the perception of a human being, where currency is associated with life, with survival, quality of life. We've gone so far into the darkness that something that means absolutely nothing has now taken on importance. And I've seen different teachers that talk about manifesting and manifesting abundance, and somehow you're supposed to believe that the more aligned you are with God, the more material abundance that you'll have. Well, Jesus wouldn't agree <laughs> with that. Although, the Spirit is very, very gentle, so whatever symbols you need to build your confidence in the power of your mind, including manifesting, can get used by that gracious Spirit just to show you how beautiful, how perfect, how wonderful you are in Spirit, to take you in that direction. But it's, it's quite interesting that we have even churches and teachings that kind of associate manifesting abundance, material abundance. I remember I used to read some books and they would talk about abundance consciousness and poverty consciousness, and I would say, hmm. So I finally started looking through A Course in Miracles, and I thought, well, surely Jesus has something to say about poverty, since it was right in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor <laughs> in spirit. So I thought, there must be something in the Course about poverty. Oh yeah, Jesus defines poverty straight on. It's ego thinking. It has nothing to do with material abundance or material lack of material abundance. It's ego thinking. The same with simplicity. You know, I used to think I, we have these ideas about living a simple life, and I love that story of the the Indian guru who basically all he had to his name so to speak, was this little G-string yeah. that he wore, and, uh, and I think in a mat that he sat on, a mat and G-string. And then okay. when, when they stole his mat, he was very <laughs> upset, because <laughs> he thought he got down to two, <laughs> maybe three, a body, a mat, and a G-string. <laughs> and it just shows that he got so angry when they took his mat that it was like, it just shows, no, it's not. That's not simplicity. Yes. And simplicity is inspired thinking in alignment with Source, with Holy Spirit. That's, that is your abundance. Mm -hmm. That is your abundance. And that is your simplicity too. Mm -hmm. So we don't even have to worry about what they say about complex world and how the images keep dividing, and marketing, and all the explosion of images, what could that even concern you when you see that alignment with the Source is where the simplicity is? That there be billions, or trillions, or zillions of images, who cares? They're all versions of nothing anyway. It's not, people say to me, is, is the world getting worse or better? I say, it's, well, it's completely neutral, it's, it's your perception that determines that. We don't even have to, we don't have to think like that anymore. <laughs> Worse and better. We don't have to think like that. So to me, this is, these are very practical ideas, very relaxing ideas. Ideas that you can fully put your whole heart in, and you can live. These are not just writings on the wall or sayings. Like the songs, we were all just getting into the rhythm of the songs and the depth and of the experience. That, as Crystal said, beyond the words, beyond the instruments, beyond the sounds. Can, can you clarify what you meant by the poverty is what the ego 
Thank Ego you. thinking. Is it just that we're perceiving, we're perceiving creating uh, poverty by, by judging it as that? What do you mean by that exactly? Well, it's actually just even more direct than that. It's that, that all ego thoughts are part of the condition of poverty, poverty. So what he's doing is he's lifting our definition of poverty from the world. So we might say poor countries, you know, poor conditions and so on and so forth. He's lifting it up to the level of mind and he's saying, as long as you're thinking with the ego, you're thinking with the ego thought system, you're poor. So basically, that would be the majority. We could say the majority of the world, and of course, is poor. Uh, in that sense, Jesus was wealthy, and, and many are poor in the sense that that they they have ego thinking. They don't know who they are. And I've found that, that that helped me too, because I started to lift all my definitions up. Like for example, when I had all these the dialogues with Jesus, I was always saying, well, I want a sense of freedom, I, I have to have a sense of, of intimacy, and I do want a sense of ease and abundance in my life. And what I found was that he said, yeah, again, those are all things that, that are part of your natural inheritance. You were created in those states of mind, but your definitions now are so tied into form that your definitions of intimacy are so tied up in the body, mm. that your definitions of abundance are so tied up in money, mm. and your definitions of freedom are so tied up in the mobility of the body, mm. that he said you've gone off mm. into poverty, into ego thinking. Mm. And so when we free our mind, we, we do this mind training, we have our mental practice, our devotional spiritual practice, we really are coming into a true sense of, of abundance, of freedom and intimacy. You know, he says, you really believe you would starve unless you have stacks of green paper strips and piles of metal discs. He's poking fun at that. When he talks about the real world, he's talking about the happy dream, he said, the real world has no buildings and no stores to buy endless things that you don't even want and don't even need. I mean, he, he just really starts needling the whole perception of the world. Which is important, because when the mind's addicted to that perception, it needs some kind of a contrast, mm -hmm. something from beyond the trap, to, to lift it out of the trap. And, um, also, I came from uh, an, a very much of an education background. I think a lot of a lot of people have been part of that belief that better education will solve the problems. And uh, we've had a lot of educational reforms. Actually, if you look back at the, the decades, we've had many, many educational reforms. We've had lots of education. We still have world wars, you know, or regional conflicts. We still have seemingly poverty, starvation, all the problems of the world, education hasn't solved anything. And I came from a family where my mother was a teacher, I was in university for 10 years, teaching graduate assistants, and all the, I was right in the middle of it. I even went into, into education, the teacher's college it was called. So I got to see it from the inside and everything. And that's when the course came in, to my life, and um, so I dropped it. I, I did drop it like a hot potato because I was being convinced from the Course that he said, you've overlearned this world. <laughs> the learning is, has imprisoned you. It has not freed you. And I came from a background where education was really great stuff. I mean, everybody saved money for education, and I went right into it for 10 years. I got to go in the middle of the beast, and <laughs> check it out from the inside, and start to see, oh, it's part of the problem. Mm -hmm. It's not the solution. 
That seems pretty radical. I've not been invited to any high schools. Not commencement speeches. Commencement speeches. I've been at this 25 years. I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. I end up here in this living room instead of commencement speeches. I quit UCLA, so I'm like, I, I wouldn't mind going to Maharshi uh, University where our friend Jim Carrey has delivered a very nice wow. commencement. Yeah. And that was quite well received, you yeah. know. But, um, but it's, it's, it is again showing us that the world's backwards and upside down. And that just means we really do need to be very open and intuitive. Because we're being taken in a direction that's different than any of us were raised with. Mm -hmm. We're beginners every day. We're, we're, like they say, Zen beginners mind. <laughs> we're, we're happiest when we're in beginner state of mind and, and clueless about absolutely everything. And start the day with that frame of mind. Like, mm -hmm. I do not know, and show me. Mm -hmm. It's such a glorious way to live every single day. I have a question. Yes. What do you think about, um, you know, we, we try and practice this sort of thing, you go to sleep at night, you have these dreams that are completely undermining it. And it's not something that you, you know, seem to have control over. Yeah, I can talk to that. I mean, I was saying that when I got here. <laughs> because Chris, when Chris came up and put his tent on, but he had a night of, of dreams that were kind of, yeah, pretty full on and intense. He was glad when he woke up in the morning and, <laughs> glad that's not real. But that happens a lot of times when I've, I've been with people and lived with them and the, the other dreams get stirred up. It really, I think in a health way, it's, it's actually possible before you go to sleep to invite the Holy Spirit yeah, to come that. into your dreams. I've tried that. Yeah. It, they, and you're saying it just got even more stirred up. <laughs> yeah. Which is good. It's I like guess. the Holy Spirit is doing the, I call it roto rooter. Yeah, right. It's like going grinding down the there, helping to just stir some of the compressed debris up. But um, if it's if there's night terrors or nightmares, a lot of times it, it's good if you get even woken up in the middle of the night with those kind of wacky, intense dreams to wake up and, and journal. Not so much trying to figure out the dream or getting too much into dream mm -hmm. symbology, but just notice the emotions. Like when you get up, really write out those emotions, because again, that's more of our outer rings. But I think it essentially it comes down to like punishing ego type stuff. You know, the ego going, oh no, you're not, no, you're not going where you think you're going during the day. You're staying right here with me. <laughs> yeah. You fall asleep. Like a retaliation, like, okay, <laughs> yeah, you, you know. you're going to study the course during the day? Well, I've got your nights. <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> that's the way it works. Yeah, actually, we laugh about it, but for those of us who have lived through, but yeah, we're like we're all nodding our heads. <laughs> There's a lot in that. Same, same experience. Yeah. Can you just say that's kind of like a good sign that that means the ego is feeling threatened, and that's why it's fighting for its existence at that point? Yeah, yeah. You might say that that that's. The point is almost like scare tactics, like yeah. uh, you know we see it even acted out in politics. Somebody's competing in a political race; they start to dip down to the polls. Okay, pull out the negative advertising. <laughs> Let's scare the population <laughs> into voting. You know, it's it's very much what the ego does. Yeah, you know, with the nighttime dreams, it's yeah. it's okay. really trying to pick up the scare tactics. I read an article. You know, I was talking about meditation and Buddhism or something, and it's called Happy Mornings and Dark Nights. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's the kind of thing. Yeah, a friend, my friend Frances sent me this article she found on Facebook, and um, what was kind of fascinating about it was, it was these group of masters that came together that, that really 
a while back, I think it was maybe in Thailand, had, had kind of introduced Vipassana to the world. And these Vipassana masters come together, just like different ones from different places and reunions. The Vipassana masters come together. These are the ones that have been at it the longest. They're the ones that were the founders. They brought it to the world and so on and so forth. And they, interestingly enough, they came together and they went, they kind of shared their notes and they were stunned by what they were all experiencing. These kind of nightmares, these deep, dark yeah. dreams coming up. Yeah. Uh, basically, that puts it in the context. When you have a group of Vipassana masters come together and realize there's something daunting in the mind mm -hmm. that they don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. Vipassana masters. Mm -hmm. And they basically decide, we, let's start opening up away from our practice and looking at spiritual pathways, let's start looking at the mind, psychology, you know, we need better tools. Mm -hmm. This is our Vipassana masters. We need better tools because what we're facing is, a, is some kind of beast underneath it. Now that was, that starts to put things a little bit into the context. When Vipassana masters hit, hit the darkness, then you know, that is a sounding of the alarm for everyone. Like, and so people have asked me about that. They say, how did you get to be consistently happy? You know, and it's like, well, it's like, remember when we, they were sending men, men to the moon, the Apollo uh, rocket launches and everything? Remember those Apollo rockets? Those gigantic stages of fuel, the big one at the bottom, and then another stage, and another stage, and then a little teeny cone on the top where the S was, that it was like, like point zero 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 one percent humans, zero 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 two technology, and then boom, lots of fuel. <laughs> That's what you need to escape the gravity of the earth, right? Yeah. So on my spiritual journey, I just decided I'm going to pack extra fuel, and then a little more extra fuel. And some more extra <laughs> fuel, because I ain't coming back on this one. This rocket's not going up and going down into the ocean. This baby's going to be packed, packed, I mean packed. And that's what we mean by living a life of devotion. What is your fuel but your devotion? But the power of your mind, but your devotion, you know. So, that's why you, you get drawn into this, and then when you get into it, the ego is going to try to scare you away from being devoted. Mm -hmm. Because if you're devoted, then it's, and that's like, the days, are the days are numbered, the writing's on the wall. You know, and the ego definitely doesn't want that, because it depends on the mind for its existence. The ego is like a parasite. We know, we know what a parasite is, it, it, it basically, depends on something for its sustenance. It's, it's drawing the energy from the mind and dissipating that energy and cranking that energy and turning it into guilt. And it's making lots of guilt so that you'll stay stuck into the gravity of the world. And this is, we're saying, go in the other direction. So it's been good. It's been actually good. I think that's where our our spiritual communities have come in just as symbols. Like Nikita was up in Canada just kind of wandering, wondering, well, what's, what's going on? But, it, but whatever it was that brought you in deeper, you know, it, it started to provide this, the hope, the sustenance, the sustaining value of that. and. That's the way it's, it's happened for a lot of us. You know, we come in, and we see the value of, of the devotion and the support. Just being able to kind of give your life over to such a, a calling. Again, it's not so much the form, but it is in the practice, in the mind. You know, just not, 
Because Jesus says, you're, you're much too tolerant of mind wandering, yeah. he says. So anybody who thinks you could just click your fingers together, you know, he's, he's saying, no, actually you're much too tolerant of mind wandering. And the whole workbook is designed to take you deeper and deeper and make you more and more devoted. And he's just using the words more at the beginning and then taking the mind into deeper practices. He does even say that, that, that we need to go through a preparation because he says later on in the workbook we will attempt a direct approach to God. And you need to be ready. Because if you attempt a direct approach to God and you aren't ready, and you aren't prepared, it will be, he says, more traumatic than beatific. The ego will screech like it's being destroyed if you haven't taken the preliminary steps to get yourself. It would be like, yeah, it would be like trying to jump like, like Superman or fly up to the next plateau when you've actually given the ladder. And he's saying, come with me and keep climbing. <laughs> and keep climbing and stay with it. And don't get too stuck on any of the ladder, just keep pushing off. But we'll get there. So, to me, that's what A Course in Miracles is. It's a, it's a systematic mind training program to meet you wherever you believe you are. It doesn't matter where you believe you are in consciousness. Jesus is almost like, you're in a pit. And he's lowering a ladder down. And he's saying, just grab hold. Mm. And you say, where? And he, I don't care where. <laughs> <laughs> Here I'm swinging the ladder around. I'm just grab it. <laughs> which which wrong is it? I don't I don't care. Just any part. <laughs> Get it. It's a big ladder. <laughs> just grab on. And that's the way it works. And once once you grab on and you really take hold, then then you've got something really to work with. You're not just fishing in the dark anymore. You're not just in survival mode, just trying to make it through another day. Trying to make the best that you can. You know, you actually have a purpose. And and then the and the steps will follow, the rungs will follow. And you won't be given anything more than you can handle. I know sometimes people say, Are you sure? <laughs> Are you really sure? It is true. We it can get intense at times, but we never do get more than we can handle. Excuse we always can do it. I'm sorry. I, I have a question for you. You mentioned Yogananda like two times or three times. Mm -hmm. I was going to the temple for five years. And in that temple, they teach you a lot like to meditate. Meditation is everything there. But I wanted to ask you, you mentioned also about devotion and meditation. Of course, as we talked about, be still, we have to, but how is your routine? Do you meditate? What did you suggest? Well, to me, at some point it dawned on me, because I was asking Jesus about that, but but actually the workbook is the, the meditation practice. Mm -hmm. If you really look closely, you can see it's a systematic meditation practice, which is also fits in with the saying that Jesus says in the Course, he does, he does say that the Course is just one form of the universal curriculum, and there are many others. But he does say at one point, this Course has everything you need. And I like that, because if here's someone who's made it through the illusion of time and space, back to eternity, then I'm going to pay very careful attention to everything that this voice is saying to me. So when I got the Course, I took that as like, oh, this is like having Jesus at my lunch table now. That's why I would pray and use it as an oracle. So this is, if I can't hear his voice, I'm going to pray and open this book. And it was just as effective as if he was sitting in the, the chair across from me. And then when he says, this Course has everything that you need, I was one of those kind of spiritual adventurers that had lots of books, and I had all kinds of adventures and read many, many things. But when the Course came to my life, I actually felt how practical that was, and direct, that I actually stopped reading everything else. 
including in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. Those little things that you bubble gum, you used to get the little stuff. Cartoons? No. How did you get introduced to Snoopy? I came to California. That's right. And I came to Southern California. And then what? And I went to okay, a, how did, how did you I went to, a, to a humanistic psychology conference in La Jolla mm -hmm. with Rob, with uh, Francis Vaughn and uh, Carl Rogers. Mm -hmm. That was my intro. Then I, I found that the two students of Tara Singh, oh. a teacher of the course, had had the book. They had the course there and then a book, Nothing Real Can Be Threatened, and right. Ken Wapnick's Forgiveness in Jesus. So I bought all three. And I, instead of going to all these things that I had planned to go to, I spent, then I came here to, I came to LA, to Burnside Avenue, where they had the, their little house. And then that was a very powerful experience. The sayings on the wall and meeting the people, and it was kind of my, I became initiated very quickly into that. But I also took it as, this was, I was taking it, these instructions were coming from spirit to me in a very direct way, and I was going to follow. And I, of course I overestimated where I was on the spiritual journey. I was. I thought, I've got the course now, which mountain do I go to to ascend? And then the spirit left and said, no, you're at the beginning. No, you're not at the end. We're not ascending today. It was almost like a, a chuckle inside. Ah, he wants to ascend. <laughs> you know, because it's, we all go through that humbling thing. Yes. Yeah, Benjamin Crane kind of Latreya. I've, I've kind of come across a lot of that stuff and everything, and um, yeah, I think I've got, enjoyed some of the teachings and everything. I, it's again the idea of um, of Christ returning or whatever. A lot of people are interested in in all a lot of ideas around that, but I would say that the first coming of Christ was was we'll say the creation of Christ by God, and the second coming of Christ is, is remembering yourself as the Christ. So it's purely more in a, in a level of mind, awakening, not so much in terms of different beings and everything, that we have a full plate every day <laughs> to deal with in forgiving the world and accepting ourselves as the living Christ. So, there's a lot of the things that have been symbolic, and so, um, and there's even books that come out that are like, they call them Course in Miracles spin-offs, or complementary courses, and all kinds of things like that. I could, I could spend a month going into all the nuances of that. I myself have taken the approach of, of taking on the spiritual practice, and then in the in the 1990s, people, there were people that started showing up and saying, David, I am your student, you are my teacher. And I kind of looked back and said, oh, this is strange. And I looked at the manual for teacher and I said, well, that must be what's happening, this uh, phenomenon. But um, these people had come from a wide variety of backgrounds, and so what I would do is I would just, they would always say, quoting this one, quoting that one, this avatar, this teacher, this book, this video, this DVD. I would say, well, I don't mind, I'm not going to compare and contrast any kind of teachers or whatever, because that's pointless. I said, if you are working with uh, a book or a mantra or a spiritual practice or anything that, that you find triggers something within yourself, that brings up your authentic question, then you can bring it in to our sessions and quote it, and then we'll go into it. But we're not, I'm not going to be making proclamations and declarations on teachers and books and yeah. all that stuff. It's pointless. 
It's a comparison as an ego device. And, I'm, and I'm, I have no interest in doing that. So that was good, because then they felt free to bring in whatever book, whatever photograph, or whatever was triggering or helping them, and we would, we would use it to go into it together. And then I think, as it moved on, I, I put a strong emphasis on divine providence, on undoing these beliefs and scarcity and all these dependencies, just learning to be very intuitive and, and get in touch with your internal teacher, and follow the eternal teacher and recognize the strength and the invulnerability that comes from that intimate experience with the internal teacher. And then they can call it whatever they want. The words don't even matter. But the experience is like, let's strengthen that, let's grow strong. So that's been really very amazing to, to behold over the years. And, and so, in the end, it's part of that collapse of thinking that there's an inner and an outer even. It's, you know, it's, it's just coming to that state of grace, feeling that presence, and radiating that presence with every possible opportunity that comes. Are you ascending, David? <laughs> I feel like I still just want to ask Dari, are you ascending when you leave here this time? <laughs> what do you mean by this time? <laughs> <laughs> so I think this body I could be wrong, but it seems like we keep coming back until we take the final loop. Yeah, I've been saying that yeah, the, the gig is up <laughs> this awesome. lifetime. I've even had a friend of mine here from California said that that I would be, the body would be gone in less than two years. Well. And so, I said, I, I, I just am not really interested in the form. Because <laughs> to me it's a state of mind, and whatever, but, you know, it's just... Two years from when? What? <laughs> what was that? Less than two years. That means right now I think it's where it's coming Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It seems like it seems like the errors are projected to the, the personality to the body. So it's like it seems like the mistakes and the errors are are in the form, but it's actually a perceptual error. It's almost like if there was one clear lens where you could see everything perfectly clear and whole, and one distorted, fragmented lens. But the fragmented lens is the error, is the sin, is the mistake. And the holistic lens is the correction. But it seems to be projected onto form. And that's part of the ego's trick, because sins are always connected to bodies. Because mm. that's the link. Mm -hmm. And I was just here reading my lesson, recording it the other day, and, and the lesson was, I am not a body. I am free. So you see where the innocence is going to come, is, is it's going to come through spiritual vision, it's not going to come through through bodies. So that's part of the, the loosening of the identification. And for me, the way it's worked is, is, is letting the body be used as a communication device. So for many, some have to take more of a meditative route, which is stilling the mind, and some may have like Tai Chi, or they have movement meditations, and yoga, there's, there's many different routes of coming to the same experience. But for me, mine was kind of listen, follow, like, okay, if the body's meant as a communication device, then use it. Use me, kind of like is with the prayer. And then, that put me into a reliance on guidance, because again, the words are not chosen by a person. It's showing up and just saying, use me, use me, use me, put the words in my mouth, speak for me. 
go before me, you know, that that's the prayer of the heart. And then then the body just gets used in that way and used in that way in countless opportunities. And again, it's not just the words, it's you, you smile, you laugh. Smile and laughter is more universal symbols than words, because words have all the language. We don't need interpreters for smiles and hugs and laughter. You know, that, that's part of it, too. Music has been huge for me. Music has, has been instilling my mind. I just have opened up to the spirit and say, bring in, bring in the music. And even though I, I, I penned this thing called Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment, I, I still feel that we all are going to be part of the music lover's yes. guide to enlightenment. Then that, it's so experiential, you can just dip, dip into it and dive into it so beautifully.